Well, today I'd like to um, continue our discussion on thyristors. Um, since we spent a little bit of time going over the exam, we may not finish the thyristor discussion today. If we don't finish it today, we will finish the thyristor um, discussion on Wednesday. Um, so um, we started looking at SCRs last time. Um, and today I'd like to talk about some basic circuits and some of their limitations. Then I'll talk about triax, and then I'll talk about some other thyristor types. Um, recall that a thyristor was a, a stacking of three junctions, an NP, NP type junction, and we saw that it occurred laterally um, in a standard Volk CMOS process, something that we probably didn't plan for. Um, and we can also form it intentionally um, in special bipolar processes. Um, and that's what I'm most interested in right now. So here, um, but the operation is the same, whether it's in a lateral uh, device in a CMOS process or it's a special bipolar process. The question is, what do we, what do you use these for? Um, what was the key characteristic of the transistors that gave us the switching action of this thyristor. There was a key property of a bipolar transistor that was necessary for this switching action to work. What property was that? I remember. What property of the bipolar transistor was necessary for this to work? You recall for small gate currents, there was no anode current, but for large, gate currents, it turned on and it stayed on. What property of the bipolar transistor was necessary for this to happen? Matt? High beta? Um, high beta for? Uh, for transistor um, to go on and stay on to do better. Right, right. High beta for large currents and what for small currents? Low beta. Low beta for small currents. The fact that beta was large for large currents and the beta was very small for small currents is what allowed it to stay off until we got the current above a certain level and then once it came on, it stayed on. Okay. And then we looked at the ideal operation of a, an SCR and we had this thing that kind of looked about like a diode characteristic. We had a hook on the side. And we saw that as we changed the gate current or the gate voltage, we pulled that hook in and out. Now, you won't see this ideal model in, in uh, I haven't seen any textbooks. So don't expect to go look this ideal model up in, in, in a textbook. Um, but I define this as an ideal model for uh, an, uh, an SCR. And I think we'll see where this comes from in a minute. Okay, so um, as you increase the gate current, when zero, the hook stays way out here. When you increase the gate current, the hook comes in and it almost disappears. And again, you let the current um, go smaller again, the hook goes back out. So you control that <coughs> um, with the gate current or the gate voltage. Um, and then we looked at um, the operation of an SCR when we had current flowing in the gate or we had a rather large gate voltage so the hook is in right now and of course if we're in this situation where this is the load line for the circuit what is the status of the SCR is it on or off here it's what it's off it's off because the current zero right and there's only a single solution and then as we increase the um, voltage, and here, is it on or off? Whoops. Now it's, it's off, it's off, it's off, single solution, but it's on, it's on up here, comes back down, turns off right here, comes back the other direction, off, turns on right here, it's on up here, it's on as we're coming down here, stays on, whoop, turns off here. Is that clear? And how do we move that load line up and down in a circuit like this? Change the voltage, change VAC. It happens naturally if the voltage VAC is like 110 
10 volt line voltage. Okay. So this is turning on and off about half the time. If this hook's really small here, it's on about half the time and it's off about half the time. Okay. So let's look at an application. Um, so here is that same circuit. I'm going to define the load voltage to be the voltage across RL. Now, when you're analyzing these circuits or designing circuits, be careful so you keep track of what the load voltage is and what the output voltage is. We might call the voltage VF the output voltage. Keep in mind the output voltage and the load voltage sum together to equal VCC. So um, here is uh, the voltage VCC. It's an AC voltage. Could be 110 volt vo um, voltage. Oftentimes it is. Could be 220 volt voltage. Oftentimes it is. Okay. And I built an electronic circuit, maybe. And this electronic circuit is synchronous with the input. And I take this electronic circuit and I put a gate current pulse in um, every so often. And here I'm going to put the gate current pulse in right when the voltage reaches peak. We can design a circuit to do that pretty easily. And of course, as soon as the current goes high, it turns on. And what does it take to turn it off? Got to cut the power. Voltage has to get below zero. So you turn it on here, and the um, um, voltage across the load then immediately is the load it is the voltage of the AC. And as the load voltage goes down, you don't get a reverse in direction until you get to this point right here. When you get to this point here, it turns off, current goes to zero, voltage goes to zero across the load, and it stays that way until you trigger it again, and you turn it on again. So if I do this, I get a 25% duty cycle on the output, if I trigger it right here. If I build the circuit to trigger it a little bit, early, a little bit later in the cycle, so I wait to trigger here, I get something less than 25% duty cycle. And if I trigger it earlier, I get something more than 25% duty cycle. In fact, if I trigger it right here, I get a 50% duty cycle. So by controlling this triggering signal, I can control the duty cycle on the output. Is that clear? <clears throat> Here's an actual SCR. Um, and if you look at the transfer characteristics, um, ideally a good SCR, this would be real flat here. Ideally this would be very vertical, and ideally this distance would be very small. And ideally this distance would be very small. So we see where our hooks bottle came from. Here's an actual SCR, and in the ideal case, delta F Delta uh, VF goes to zero, and horizontal line to the to the left is flat. So we and, and this hook here is is ideally very 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 small. It's very small on a current um, associated with that hook. Um, we call this the forward breakover voltage, the, the tip of the hook. The tip of the hook is controlled by the gate voltage you put in or the current we put in, and they're related to each other about by the diode equation. Um, and then we have a reverse breakdown, much like a regular diode. Um, if you reverse bias it too much, the thing breaks down. And this is probably a destructive breakdown in most circuits. Okay? So we would never want to have this happen. <coughs> if you change the gate current, um, for large gate currents, this hook pulls in. And for smaller gate currents, it pushes out, and eventually for gate current equals zero, it's out here someplace. So we see the hook going in and out, as we had in our ideal model um, of the SCR. If you look at the operation with a actual SCR, it's very much like we described previously. Um, this is the load line. The, the load line was obtained by saying VCC is equal to IF RL plus VF, that was the load line. And again, we can see as we change the, the voltage VCC, this load line will go back and forth like we showed before. Right here, how many solutions are there to, this, to the circuit? If it's sitting here. 
There's two stable and one unstable solution. Stable solution, unstable, stable. What state will it be in if, uh, if, uh, if I'm sitting here on this line? What solution will we have? Abdullah? I would say the higher one. You could be right. What else could you say? The lower one. And you could be right. And you could be wrong too. So what will be the solution here? Abdullah might be right, and Abdullah might be wrong. Well, it depends on which state you put it in. If you put it in this state here, it'll stay there. If you put it in this state here, it will stay there. So the solution depends on what state you put it in. These are kind of weird devices, aren't they? <coughs> it, it has memory, it remembers which state it's in. So, so there's still two stable equilibrium points like we showed for the ideal model. Um, delta VF is quite constant. It's so nearly vertical. It's, it's around one volt for most devices. We saw that earlier. We looked at how those two transistors operated. Recall one of the transistors, there were two in series, and one was in saturation, and one was hard biased on. So you have about 0.7 plus about 0.2, so it's close to one volt. Remember that? Okay. So this voltage here is about around one volt. If large currents are flowing, the power in the anode, so the product of, of the voltage VF and this current here, that's the power in the anode, can be pretty big. If I have 100 amps of current flowing, and there's one volt across here, I have 100 watts of dissipation in the, in, in the anode. That's quite a bit of power to be dissipated in the anode, isn't it? But if this was 110 volts, and I had 100 amps flowing, the amount of power that's flowing in the load I turned on is much, much, much bigger. So even though this SCR can dissipate a fair amount of power when it's on, the power it dissipates is often very small compared to the amount of power that's controlling the load. Um, power in the gate's very small. You've got <coughs> currents comparable to a small signal diode controlling the gate. In fact, we can make that current negate as small as we want. We can make the device real sensitive, so maybe even microamp currents turn it on. But that might not be a very good SCR. Because if you have noise present, and it has very, very small currents that are required to turn it on, it may accidentally turn on sometimes if you don't want it to turn on. So we would like the gate current to be small, but we don't want the sensitivity to be too high or it wouldn't be easy to use the device. Make sense? Um, so the total power in the device is the sum of the two powers, the power in the anode and the power in the gate, but you can pretty much neglect the power in the gate. Are we care, do we care much about the power in the uh, SCR? What we're using is a switch. The only reason we care about the power in the SCR is to be sure we spec it right so we don't burn it out. And so we put the right heat sinks on so we can keep it cool. We really care about the power we deliver to the load, not the power that's being dissipated in the SCR. Just don't burn it out. So if you want to turn it on, if, if you're in the off state, to turn it on then what do we have to do? Now we're not using a, an ideal SCR, we're using an actual SCR. So we start out here on the green curve, and we assume that we're in the off state. To turn it on, what do you have to do? Increase the gate current. What? Increase the gate current. Increase the gate current. This is, this is the gate current. Increase the gate current to pull the hook in. And as soon as the hook gets past this point here, it will turn on, and then we can let the hook go back out again if we want to, and it will stay on. Okay. So this is exactly analogous to what we had in the ideal SCR. We've already talked about these parameters for the device. 
Um, so let me not go through that, that terminology again. Some issues um, about these devices. The trigger parameters, IGT and VGT, are highly temperature dependent. Any intuition as to why that's the case? Why do you think they're highly temperature dependent? This temperature affects the area of the level of that cross sectional area. Pardon? On that cross sectional area of, yes. the, of the gate. Yes. Mm -hmm. So it's colder it shrinks, it's more resistant. Yeah, that's not the that's that's a good guess. That's not the reason. What is the gate really on this device? Diode. It's a diode. And what about the diode's IV characteristics? They're not going to be based on temperature. They're highly temperature dependent, right? Slight change in temperature results in a dramatic change in the current. So we would expect these devices to be have have their trigger characteristics highly temperature dependent. So when you're designing a circuit, you'll have to look at worst case temperature characteristics of the device to be sure it works correctly. We want the gate sensitive, but not too sensitive. You pointed that out a bit ago. SDR can switch very large currents. But if, you, if you're switching 100 amps, the power can be pretty large too. Is that roughly a volt drop or a little bit more across the, the uh, anode to cathode? Yes? Uh, how do you increase your um, current into your gate in this situation? Like with that configuration, how do you increase that current? Well, this is, this is not a good circuit here. This is meant to show what's going on. Okay. This is circuit's analogous to this circuit right here. This circuit on the gate. What's wrong with this circuit? This is the diode now, right? So all those are going to be on or off. So what if I if I accidentally went up to about 0.8 volts here? What would happen to the circuit? Have a very high current. I mean, it might be it might be kiloamps of current. So this circuit is very sensitive to the voltage here. And if you make this a little bit too big, you'll burn your diode out. Okay. So the question is, how do you control the current on this circuit here? Well, this is not a good circuit because it's just like change that gate voltage would, would make the current change too much. So if we want to build it into a useful circuit, we probably put a resistor in series with VG to limit the current. Okay, good question. Um, heat sinks are widely used to manage the power. A lot of times these big devices are really big. A lot of times they'll be on a bolt maybe a half inch bolt or three quarters inch bolt or one inch bolt and you bolt it onto a major heat sink to get the heat out. Um, um, exceeding the revert breakdown voltage would you destroy the device in most circuits. Um, exceeding the forward breakover voltage can destroy some devices. The lack of electronic turnoff is unattractive for some applications, many applications. We know how to turn this on, but it might be hard to turn it off. Um, we can turn it off if we put an AC voltage on it, um, but if you put a DC voltage on it, it's hard to turn it off. It's great for alarm circuits, but we can also build alarm circuits with logic, which will do about the same thing. Um, we get a maximum of 50 minute duty cycle in AC applications, and that's not attractive. So if you, if you use this to control, a hundred, if a load was a 100, uh, was 100 watt light bulb, you could only get a 50% duty cycle um, on the current going in that light bulb. So it wouldn't be putting out nearly 100 watts. Make sense? So let's look at triacs. Um, So the limitation of this SCR is it only conducts current one direction. And we can't either turn it off. In 
here's we saw where the 50% duty cycle came from. Oh, and of course, in this case, the SCR is always off. We never get big enough. We never get past the hook. So it stays off all the time. Does everybody see that? It goes up but never gets past the hook. Now we have a large current flowing in the gate. It's still small, but, large, but, but on a relative basis, a large current flowing into the gate. So the hook's pulled in. It's off here. It's off here. And here's where we had 50% duty cycle. This gives us about a 50% duty cycle on the output when it's completely on. And here's somewhere in between. We have the hook out part way, and they put the AC voltage in in this particular circuit here. We see it's off here, it's off here, it's off here, it's off, and tells you that there it's on. So we have a little bit less than 50% duty cycle here. So we can use it for light dimmers pretty easily um, if we just control that, that gate voltage. But the light would any, be anywhere between off and 50% on. Make sense? Okay. So now let's get the triad. Well, there's an easy way to take care of that. Let's just take two SCRs, put them back to back. So let one conduct current one direction and one conduct current the other direction. Um, so there's two cross coupled SCRs. There's some limitations in this approach. First of all, the size and cost overhead with this solution, we got two instead of one. <coughs> and probably an equally big issue is inconvenient triggering. Since we have to turn this one on by establishing a voltage with respect from, from, from this gate to main terminal two, and to turn this one on or off, we have to establish a voltage from gate to main terminal one. So if the voltage uh, from main terminal one to main terminal two was 110 volt AC, we would find that our logic circuits that, that might control um, the gate G1 might be referenced to ground. This might be a ground. So we could reference those to ground, but then we're gonna have to reference this logic circuit up to the AC voltage. And if it's 110 volts, that'd be about 180 volts voltage. It'd be going up and down and up and down and up and down. Could we do that? Could we have two logic circuits, one reference to ground and one reference to this AC voltage going up and down? We want to turn them on simultaneously or off simultaneously, can we do that? Yeah, but there'd be a lot of work having two different references for our logic circuits. Does that make sense? If you grounded this terminal, <coughs> This control gate voltage could be a logic signal relative to ground. If this voltage was then swinging up and down long ways, this voltage here would have to be a reference to this high voltage. So you'd have two, you'd have two logic circuits, one controlling this and one controlling this, and, and the relative voltages would be changing all over the place. So we might build some optical couple isolators or something to couple those two together. We could make it happen but it's not convenient. Make sense? What are optical coupled isolators? Optical isolators. We build two logic circuits, two DC power supplies. One of the DC power supplies would be referenced to this terminal, one to this terminal. And then we might take an optical signal that would connect the two together that optical signal would have no electrical connection, so they could be at entirely different DC voltage levels. But there's a fair amount of overhead to do something like that. So um, here's a bi-directional um, switching with a triac. So instead of having two separate SCRs, um, we have this five-layer device. Um, and this device is controlled by a single um, gate voltage. Um, with respect to main terminal one. So here's one SCR, and here's another SCR. 
The one on the left current will flow from main terminal one to main terminal two, and the one on the right, the current will flow from main terminal two to main terminal one. And they're both controlled by the voltage from gate to main terminal one. So it has two cross-coupled SCRs. Um, it's manufactured by diffusions, uh, but it's got a single gate control. Actually, the cost for making this is not much more than the cost for making the SCR. So I can look at two cross-coupled um, um, transistor pairs. This might correspond to um, the triac on the left. This might correspond to the triac on the right. We go through the same analysis we did before for the SCR to show how this turned on. Um, for a, a triac, we define different quadrants of operation. And the quadrants are op of operation are defined um, in the VMT21 to um, um, I'd say that again. In the plane for the voltage from main terminal two to terminal one, and the voltage from the gate to main terminal one. So the voltage from main terminal two to main terminal one is the voltage from here to here, and the voltage from gate to main terminal one is the voltage from here to here. So I can look at two planes then, whether this voltage here is positive, or, or uh, look at a plane, excuse me, whether this voltage here is positive or relative, or this voltage negative, and likewise, whether this voltage here is positive or this voltage is negative. So that plane then becomes the voltage from main terminal two to one, and this is the voltage from gate to main terminal one. And in this plane, this is called quadrant one, this is called quadrant two, this is called quadrant three, and this is called quadrant four. And I've given analytical expressions for those four quadrants in the lower right hand side of this, of this slide. Notice we use only one gate to control this instead of the two gates that we talked about by putting two actual SCRs back to back. So here's an ideal triac. Again, you're not going to find this in any books, but uh, um, actual triac operation Related ideal is analogous to what we showed for the SCR. So we have two hooks. And when the gate current is zero, both hooks stick out a long ways. When the gate current is either positive or negative, the hooks pull in. So you can pull both hooks in with a positive gate current, or you pull both hooks in with a negative gate current. So the hooks are only out when the gate current is very small. The hooks are both in when the gate current, magnitude of the gate current is large. When <coughs> the magnitude of the gate current is large, it almost looks like a straight line. If you have a vertical line in the current voltage plane, what does it look like? If it were a straight line. If these hooks were if, if these hooks were zero width, so you just have a straight vertical line, what does that device look like? Sister. A uh, special resistor. A resistor of what value? Zero. zero. Resistor value zero is equivalent to what? A wire. A wire. Or a short circuit. So when the hooks are in, it looks like a short circuit. Or we're trying to make a switch. So that's probably good, isn't it? And when the hooks are out, what does it look like? 
If the hooks are way out, it looks like an open circuit, there's no current's gonna flow. <clears throat> Again, we can do the load line, exactly like we did before. VCC is equal to um, ITRL plus um, VTR, what, that's the voltage on the anode of that structure, or main terminal two. And then we've got the device characteristics of the triac. First two equations, and the unknowns of this equation are the voltage and the current, so I can eliminate one and solve for the other one. The solution to the two equations is the intersection of the load line and the device characteristics, as it was for the SCR. The only difference now is the characteristics of the device have changed from those of the SCR. They're now those of the triad. So let's look at how the circuit operates. Abdullah, if we have um, this load line and IG equals zero, what is the output of the circuit? Depends on what state you want to put it in. Depends on what state you want to put it in. It's either off if it's here, or it's on if it's here. It's whatever state you would put it in, it will stay at. Um, what's the solution here? Mr. Day. It's whatever state you put it in. Uh, not quite. There's how many solutions? Oh, oh, I'm sorry, you're right. You're right. It's either here. I, I apologize. You're right. <coughs> now, what states it in? On. It's on. There's a single solution. It's the on solution. And here, what is it? It's on again. It's on with a positive current on the, on the top. It's on with a negative current on the bottom. So if, BC, if BAC is a sinusoidal signal and hooks are in, as that goes up and down, it stays on all the time. So now we have a 100% duty cycle. Make sense? Now what happens? If we have an AC voltage, so this load line, so VAC goes up and down and up and down, this load line goes back and forth and back and forth. So what is the, what's the state here? On, it moves back across here. Across here, it's still on. But as soon as it goes through the origin, it, it does what? It turns off, and it stays off until it gets past this hook. And then it'll pop on again. When it comes the other direction, it stays on until it goes through the origin here. Then it turns off, and it will stay off until it gets past this hook, and then it'll turn on again. Is that clear? Okay. So we can see it going now. It's on, it's on, it's on, it's on, it's off. There's back on again. Did everybody see that? Yes. Oh, I guess one of the things I'm confused about is what is the benefit to this device over the devices we already have? Like, can we model these characteristics with like MOSFETs? Yeah. Um, we can make MOSFETs to control large currents as well. And um, those are used quite a bit as well. The power industry uses a combination of power MOSFETs um, and thyristors. These have the ability, we'll, we'll, we'll look, look in a minute, these have the ability to have literally kiloamps of current flow in them. Yes. Is it possible to independently control the size of the two hooks? Nope. Well, not in my ideal model. Question is, could you design a device that would, that would have different characteristics for the positive, for the positive going hook and the negative going hook? 
Um, I'm guessing the answer is yes, but I'm not a power devices guy, so I don't know for sure. Usually we don't try to do that. Usually we try to make them symmetric. So here's a, an actual triac, much like the um, actual SCR. It just goes out on both sides. Um, again, the on voltage in both directions is small. It's around one plus one volt if the current's positive. It's around negative one volt if the if the current's negative. And now we'll go back and look at putting a, a gate control signal in. In this case, I'm putting a positive gate current in. And I trigger it right here. <coughs> I didn't draw the circuit, but here I turn it on. And so it stays on until it goes to zero again. Here I turn it on again. So what we see is now we've got 50% duty cycle since we're able to um, get both positive and negative currents flowing. If I trigger it near the start of the, uh, of the um, waveform, I get near 100% duty cycle. And if I trigger it near the end of the waveform, I get near 0% duty cycle. These are used to control lights, control motors. They're used for doing DC to AC conversion, a lot of, a lot of other things. Here are the four quadrants that um, I've um, specified. Now, these are the quadrants of operation of the device. And these are the IV characteristics of the device. So you can identify which quadrant you're operating in in the, the current voltage plane. Um, um, so for example, if we're operating here, where the gate current is positive, that means the gate voltage is positive, and the current is positive, that means the voltage from main terminal two to main terminal one is positive, we'd be operating in quadrant one. Positive currents would be here, positive voltage would be here. Over here, the gate currents are still positive, so I've got fixed gate currents. Gate currents are positive, but the uh, but the voltage is negative. So if the gate currents are positive, I'm to the right of this vertical line, and I'm um, and, and the um, voltage are negative. This would be in quadrant four. So this is quadrant one and quadrant four. In the main terminal <coughs> two to one to VGT one plane. Make sense? So this is quadrant one, this is quadrant four. Um, here, I've got negative currents. Um, no, um, here I've got negative currents, and here I've got positive currents. So I design my circuit so that I put, put negative currents here, and so I put positive currents here. I design my control circuit that way. So here I've got positive gate currents and positive current, which means I'm in quadrant one. And here I've got negative gate currents, which means the voltage from gate to terminal one is negative, and negative currents so are in quadrant three. So this corresponds to quadrant one and quadrant three operation. Here I'm controlling it all with negative currents. So if I'm all negative currents, that means I'm over here, and I'm going between quadrants two and three. Make sense? So deciding, depending on how you, you build your control circuit, you can operate in different quadrants to turn it on and off. The curves may not be symmetric quite between quadrant one and quadrant three. So this almost answers your question a bit ago about whether we can control the, the magnitude of those, of those characteristics. The turn on current may be large and variable in quadrant four. Quadrant four here. So we typically try to avoid operation quadrant four. You don't usually design your circuit so you stay in quadrant one, quadrant two, or quadrant three. It's most common to operate in, by, by, between quadrants two and three or between quadrants one and three. So here's a, 
a circuit where we're control it by changing the gate voltage, putting fixed gate voltage and changing the resistance. And if we do that, this is going to operate between quadrant one and quadrant four. Because this voltage is always positive, and this voltage can be positive or negative. This is not a good circuit because it's operating in quadrant four. The circuit on the right, we change the polarity of this around, and put a negative voltage on here. This will now operate between quadrants two and quadrant three. The circuit on the right is a better circuit than the circuit on the left because we avoid quadrant four. Everybody's wiggling. I just assume that means time's up. That's all for today, thanks. Oh, thank you. Thank you. You were sitting over here, right? No. Oh, yeah, yeah, wait, wait. Excuse me. Do you need the homework right now or by five o'clock? Five o'clock. Okay. Yeah. There you go. Yes. Uh, I can uh, for the example. Uh, yeah, class. Class. yeah, you need to come by my office. Yeah. Office. Okay. Office hour? What? Is that office hour? I'll be in between 11 and 12. Okay. <laughs> Is this uh, the current one? Yes. Uh, thank you for emailing my exam. You got it. Good.